Welcome to yet another presentation in our series Rereading Revelation. This is pre presentation number 27. We have been reading this book in pursuit of its vision of healing. <coughs> and I am now a little sad to say that this will be the last presentation in the series proper. So uh, for the last <coughs> six topics we have been looking at images of healing in the book of Revelation. Uh, Revelation and the name as the most important, the tears, the earth, the city, the nations, and today Revelation and time. Now, yes, this is the last one in the series proper, but I do plan to make, to have three presentations that I call postscripts, <coughs> or a postscript, so I'd like to discuss a little outside the text, a little at a distance from the text, Revelation's twin in the Old Testament. Which book in the Old Testament is Revelation's genuine twin? And then <coughs> to have a reflection on estimates and underestimates of the book of Revelation. And then to put Revelation in dialogue with some of the leading voices, some of the most interesting voices in our time. So that's like, that's our PS. But now let's look at Revelation and time. <clears throat> so again, this illustration that the name is what centers <clears throat> everything in Revelation. It's all centered around illuminating the name, the kind of person God is. And the other elements here are uh, around, belong around that. So name here, time here, time out there. <coughs> but <coughs> there is a reason to pay a special attention, particular attention to time, because time has been seen as in many ways the main, the main organizing uh, element. So. If there is a serious competitor to the name as the one thing to keep at the center, then that one thing could be, <coughs> could be time. So someone has said <coughs> that chrono chronology is the backbone of history, that without chronology history becomes a kind of uh, hodgepodge, you can't make any, <coughs> any sense out of it. So, one cannot discount the element of chronology when we look at history. We cannot, in other words, discount time. Time is important and we should not ignore it. And then you have <coughs> Ernst Käsemann in Germany who says that it was apocalyptic which first made historical thinking possible within Christendom. And apocalyptic, that is the kind of literature Revelation is, and the book of Daniel and some other sections in the Old Testament. So, <clears throat> so thinking that, that history becomes particularly interesting or of interest when we look at this type of literature is also a fair, a fair thing to say. <clears throat> well, let's now look at some uh, time elements in the book of Revelation. A kind of sense of time and there is one term that that comes and recurs and is quite <coughs> quite characteristic. So let's read these texts. Look, I am coming soon. Blessed is, he, is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. That's in chapter 22, 7. And it is also a similar text in Revelation 1, 7. And then same chapter, chapter 22, look, I'm coming soon and my reward is with me to give to each one according to his or her work. And then see the third time in chapter 22, the last chapter in Revelation, the one who testifies these things say, says, surely, I am coming soon. So there is sense of time here. There is interest in time and soon is, a, is an important uh, 
indicator of time, <coughs> the term for time. And what could it mean? Well, <coughs> you could have soon that qualifies time. That is to say, soon means I'm coming without delay, I'm coming right away, coming at once, soon in that respect. <coughs> or you could have soon qualifying the action, the speed with which the action will happen, quickly, swiftly, rapidly. And I suppose this illustration is more for the second. You see the quality of the action here. <coughs> so, but Revelation's word is soon and, and is interested in, in time and in some ways knowing <coughs> that the recipients of these, this book to us as recipients, it means, time means something. And the assurance that something is to happen soon is therefore of interest to us as well. <coughs> so, aside from that emphasis in chapter 22, we can look at certain categories of time, like qualitative time. Soon is time in a qualitative sense. So we have these terms, the time is near at the beginning and the ending of the book. The time is short, that's in relation to the bad side in, in, in this book. <clears throat> we have a short while in chapter 17, and then we have soon here at the end of, of the book. Near, short, soon. Those are terms, qualitative terms for time. And then we have a point in time, <clears throat> that there is also a sense of a time, a sort of critical point. In the seven trumpets, <clears throat> the four angels were released who had been held ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year to kill a third of humankind, and not a good thing. But this is a point in time similar to what you have in our illustration. And then we have a profusion of terms denoting time in a, in a quantitative sense, or at least suggesting time as a certain quantity. The shortest half an hour in 8.1, one. one hour, a single day, three and a half days, ten days, five months, 42 months, 1260 days, time times and half a time, a thousand years, and then forever and ever, which straddles the, con the, the, the category of qualitative time and quantitative time, time without end. So <clears throat> is Revelation interested in time? It seems very much to be interested in time and to sort of feed us almost like teasers feed us these concepts we would like to know is this to be taken literally is it <clears throat> you know should one attempt to translate it uh, and so on or or sort of uh, interpret it and break it down to <clears throat> specific time periods so this is just to show that time looms large in the book of revelation i have said that even so, it doesn't loom large enough to replace the name as Revelation's main concern. <clears throat> but it makes a good case. There is a, an importance to time in this book. So much so <clears throat> that as we saw at the beginning of these, this series, we saw that the schools of interpretation of Revelation, they are all time-centered. The preterists look at Revelation and thinks that the main action is in the first century, so it's past time in relation to us. The futurist is very much concerned about time. It's our time. It is whatever we seem to be experiencing now, read as though it is fulfillment <coughs> of the book of Revelation. And then we have the historicist who looks to uh, to the uh, to the to looks at the future from the point of view of the first century, 
till the end of time. So there is a more comprehensive vision of history there. <coughs> so let's <coughs> look at one particular uh, term here then, because this is the one that has had the most uh, interest, and this is then mostly in the historicist sort of uh, vision. I am not planning to discuss much about the preterist view of time, because it's kind of run out. And I'm not planning to discuss the futurist uh, view of time, because <coughs> I will say, and I am saying that without apologizing, that the futurist understanding of Revelation is in some ways to this book what, <coughs> what QAnon is to, to uh, it's without, it's very hard to, <coughs> to pin it down, to make, to make sense of it. So I'm not going to invest in a critique of futurist uh, things, but I'm going to look at some uh, historicist uh, ideas in relation to this period, the 42 months, the 1260 days, the time times and half a time, because these are really <coughs> synonyms for a same period of time in a quantitative sense. So <coughs> in Revelation we have these terms, 42 months here in 11.2 and 13.5, and the 1260 days, and time, times, and half a time. <coughs> and we will see that the Old Testament background text for this is in the book of Daniel. Uh, that Daniel talks about a period of trial, a period of difficulty. They will be given into his hand for a time, times, and half a time. And then in the ending of, Revel of uh, Daniel, it would be for a time, times, and half a time, this one, this term. And as soon as the power of the holy people is shattered, all these events will be completed, Daniel 12. And then <clears throat> from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that desolates is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. <coughs> well, that must be somewhat related to the 1,260 days, if, even though it is not an identical period of time. And in <coughs> certain faith communities that have been committed to the historicist reading, these terms have been very influential. This has shaped one's understanding, one's sense of time, the sense of progression, the sense of imminence, that something is happening in our time, that we are living at the end of the history or the events or the story that is told <coughs> in the book of Revelation. So, 1260 days then have been seen as an important time period and with resources <coughs> in the book of Daniel it has been thought that this, these 1260 days represents 1260 years that can be located in history. I am not going to discuss that in detail to do that, you have to do a much bigger uh, exposition of the book of Daniel. But I will show how these <coughs> dates have, have uh, been used and have sort of come to be significant. And this <coughs> happened especially in the 19th century, in the first half of the 19th century, in the great Advent movement, where many of these uh, temporal terms in the book of Daniel, especially somewhat in the book of, Daniel, of Revelation, were used to see that there was a special significance, especially to the year uh, 1843. And many of these calculations ended then, exactly at the time when these people were living and when these people were, were thinking that they had understood something in, in, in prophecy. And the year 1798, that year was seen as the ending 
of the 1260 days, meaning 1260 years. So a time of persecution, a time of witness, a time of hardship for a believing community uh, and being in, <coughs> a, a, in some ways a difficult time. Again, I will not <coughs> do a full-fledged critique of that, just to say that these are attempts that have been made to make the time the time terms in, in these books uh, translate into specific historical periods. So here is the but, here is the but, that these attempts also come and also exemplify a path littered with shattered hopes and tears because it hasn't always been totally successful. There has been caveats, there has been other sides to it. So another <coughs> time period that has been of interest, and that is in Revelation only, the thousand years. And certain events congealing, concentrating on the time before the thousand years, the final call, preaching, there's a sealing of the believers, there's a great ordeal, it's a final opportunity, and there is the battle of Armageddon that we have looked at in our series. And then <coughs> the thousand years begin, and that is coincides with the second coming. And someone helped me with this and said that is end number one, first ending. And then after the thousand years, the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven. And then there is a final deception and a final battle. And that's end two. And we are now on earth and the ending uh, of the story and the visions of healing and revelation uh, that we are looking at now. So, so these, <coughs> what should I say, in certain faith communities that are close to my own faith community, there has been a significant investment in certain time periods more than others, such as the <coughs> 1260 days and the thousand years. Those are the main, main ones. Well, <coughs> let me transition to the experience of time more. Take it down to more a personal level, my own personal level, and the notion that time flies. And it does indeed. This is our youngest daughter when she was little. And uh, this is our oldest daughter, sorry, when she was little, <coughs> with her very inquisitive face. And this is our youngest daughter smelling some flowers, <coughs> which is actually quite typical for her type, her approach to life. And then time flies. <coughs> Here is our oldest daughter at her graduation day, having finished her PhD at Yale University, where she is now teaching theology. And our youngest daughter, many years hence, with her diploma <coughs> on her graduation from law school uh, in Oslo. So <coughs> I, the notion that time flies and that one sees one's children grow up is something that in some ways fills us with pride and fills us with gratitude. And in some ways, at least for me, fills me with just acute sadness. Just acute sadness. I would love to turn back the clock. I would love to slow time and linger a little longer in those moments <coughs> when we had our children at home and when they did leave home I just, <clears throat> I remember when our oldest daughter left home, we left her at a boarding school. As I drove off from the boarding school, I wept like a child. I could not, I could not adjust to it. And I owe my children an apology for sometimes, I think, wishing to hold them back, wishing to retain them. So <clears throat> time flies. And time is in this life finite. We cannot slow it. It will continue. We cannot sort of hold it back. And so the only remedy for the 
finitude of time <coughs> for the sense of time that slips from our hands. The only remedy for that is more time, that the supply of time would <coughs> be larger. And that is one of the gifts of the book of Revelation, that it promises <coughs> more time that there is a concept of time in Revelation that says something will last forever and ever. So that is one thing. And now to the experience of time in, in, our, in our time, in a sort of more general sense, because there was a time <coughs> when Christianity had a, had a bigger influence in society that people felt that the certainty of an afterlife was a given. And that was, in some ways, a source of comfort, because you could have an afterlife and things would be good. It was also a source of huge distress, because you might, you might not make it, and you would then be punished. And uh, in Christianity's vision of punishment, that punishment would continue forever. We have tried in our course here, in our uh, in our presentations here, we have tried to to uh, uh, to change that view and to take it off take the, take it off the screen. So here, <coughs> this is not Laurel and Hardy. These are actors in both of these scenes, actors playing <coughs> in the play uh, uh, Samuel Beckett's play, Waiting for Godot. <coughs> And waiting for Godot is in some ways also a theological statement. It is an existential statement. Waiting for something, waiting for something, waiting for someone who never comes. And the one who never comes is Godot. And Godot is a, <coughs> is a diminutive for God in a sense. You're waiting for God. And they sit here waiting and waiting and finally give up waiting because the Godot or the God never shows up. So that horizon of hope has been receding for people in our time, especially in the Western world. So here is another <coughs> time question in the book of Revelation, <coughs> the most acute time question in the book uh, and we read how uh, the victims of violence under the altar they say how long great majesty upright and trustworthy how long will it be before you decide to act justly and vindicate our blood shed by those who dwell on the earth that is a kind of waiting time the discrepancy that the believer finds between his or her expectations and reality. And, and the how long question is the question that uh, also echoes big, in a big way in the Old Testament. <clears throat> so to that how long question, we have seen an answer given to uh, the victims, to each was given a long white robe. And it was said to them to rest a short time, longer, until the number would be complete, that is, the number of the fellow servants and their brothers and sisters who were to be killed just as they had been killed. And here is an illustration of that. I will magnify it in a moment uh, <coughs> here. So there is a promise of indication there that God will, the white robe is the promise of indication, but there is no change <coughs> in the permissive policy of, uh, of, uh, uh, in relation to victims. There will be more victims. And then <coughs> what is the answer? How long here receives a qualitative answer. It doesn't say so many years, so much longer time, and so on. The answer is qualitative until the number is complete. And here you can see uh, <coughs> the illustration. Here are the victims under the altar. And here are angels giving them all white robes. The robe of vindication, the robe of hope, but not the promise that victimhood is, is over. That is not here. 
<coughs> and then there is also in Revelation time as a critical moment. We had earlier the moment in time here on the bad side in the trumpet sequence. So the four angels were released who had been held ready for the hour, the day, the month, and the year. That is a critical time. Something is moving toward a climax, toward a showdown, toward a final confrontation. And we have the same thing in Revelation 14. The first angel coming and he shouts that the hour has come, the critical moment. And there is some sort of relationship between the critical time here and the critical time here. There is a plan on the bad side in this conflict and there is a response here on the good side to what happens on the bad side. And this <coughs> scene in the trumpet sequence plays out at the river Euphrates and takes us ultimately to the battle of Armageddon. So there is a showdown, there is a movement toward a critical time, a critical point in time. So <coughs> all of this takes us to some temptations that we have in relation to time. Because, truth be told, most people feel that it should have ended by now. It should have ended by now. The victims of violence under the altar in Revelation uh, chapter 6, they think that the time is, has lasted too long. How long will it be before you decide to act justly and vindicate us? So one of the temptations in regard to time is of course impatience. And it's understandable, waiting in line, wondering, is my turn coming? Why is the line moving so slowly? And so on. And the other one, <coughs> the tem uh, other temptation is the temptation of speculation. That you have, you want to sort of master the map of time and make certain events help you, guide you, and take you sort of quicker to the conclusion, as it were. And some of these, uh, uh, or this temptation in particular, has generated <coughs> ideas many times that have been quite dis disappointing. And maybe that is one thing that should be uh, resisted. So <coughs> here is a suggestion for locating in Revelation the time concept that counts the most. And I think we could say that Revelation, the time element in the book of Revelation that is most important is the word soon. I'd like to read it again. Look, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Look, I'm coming soon. And my reward is with me to give to each according to his or her work. And then this one, Revelation 22, 20. It's almost over in the book. It's the last sort of one of the next to last things in the book. The one who testifies these things says, surely I am coming soon. So, so soon then is a key time element, putting us on the alert, putting us in, the in a state of expectation and making, you know, if we can trust the one who says it, he will come as soon as he can, as soon as everything is sort of ready, in a state of readiness. But soon means soon. It doesn't mean that you know, that the person saying soon is playing games with us. He means it. And we could then say it will happen. It will actually come to be. <coughs> so at the end of the book of Revelation, we see two things in uh, <coughs> relation to the human situation. We have tears in Revelation 21. And God's promise that he will wipe away all tears. And we have thirst 
in Revelation 22 as the element describing the human situation. Tears here and thirst here as states of need and Revelation taking an interest in them. So here is what I would sh to suggest as Revelation's most important concept of time. It isn't this time or that time. It isn't even soon, although that comes to, uh, to the top of the list of time uh, elements that are important in this book. It isn't the 1260 days. It is a word that isn't in Revelation. It's the meantime, the time in between. That is what is important. And what happens in the meantime is what Revelation brings to view in the end. Listen to this one. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let the one who hears say, come. And the thirsty, let him and her come. I wasn't making it up that there are tears in 20, chapter 21 and thirst in chapter 22. Let the thirsty come. And the one who would like to have it, let him and her take the water of life as a gift. I once gave a series in a church many years ago, and I, <coughs> I said I would talk about, uh, I will talk about the message of the Bible in one word, just one word. And then I said, will it be a noun or will it be a verb? And I said, I, I showed, great evidence showed that it will be a verb, that the Bible likes verbs better than nouns. So it will be a verb. And what will it be? What is the word? And here it is. It's the word come. It's the message of the Bible in one word. And it is the final word <coughs> in uh, the canon here in the book of Revelation, the call to come. And then <coughs> you can also see that there is a cascade here because the Spirit says it, the bride says it, and the one who hears it says it. Uh, and this is an imper actually an imperative. So uh, this is in the present tense, the spirit and the bride. They say, come, and they say it and say it and say it. That is an ongoing action. And then there is a kind of imperative to the one who hears it. Also to pick it up and say it. So come is then like, ripples in the water with an expanding <coughs> circle or like a cascade uh, of influence from the spirit via the bride and to the one who hears it. So the Bible is very serious about this. And then <coughs> we have the river, <coughs> the, the, the water that is promised is water from the river, <laughs> river of life offered to us in the present. So we have in some ways the river of the future flowing into present reality, into our parched and thirst-filled present reality. <coughs> so the separation between the future and the present is broken down. And I thought this illustration here might, might work to some extent seeing something, a, a river flowing from a future into a parched present. <clears throat> so our concept is going to be me the meantime. The spirit and the bride say, come now in what is our meantime. So it isn't, you know, looking at the calendar, thinking about this or that. It is what we actually do with the time that is at our disposal. Now, spirit and the bride say come, the ones who hears say come, and the thirsty. It's much more succinct in the Greek. And the thirsty, come. That's it. And the one who would like to have it, let him and her take the water of life as a gift. 
Because revelation doesn't think you need any other qualities in, in yourself, in ourselves. It doesn't uh, help, uh, uh, make us have any other, uh, any other qualifications than the qualification of need. Thirst, that's it. <coughs> so in the Old Testament, or in other texts in the Bible, just to round it off here with other texts that talk about thirst, on the, this is in the Gospel of John, not surprisingly, because John is maybe our, our candidate for the authorship of Revelation as well. <clears throat> so here is Jesus in the Gospel of John on the last day of the festival, the great day. While Jesus was standing there, he cried out, If anyone is thirsty, let him and her come to me and drink. As the scripture has said out of the believer's heart shall flow rivers of living water. So there is water, there is thirst, and there is the promise of this as a gift. And then, of course, <coughs> Isaiah again in the Old Testament, uh, important background text for Revelation. Ho! Oh, this is again with that sort of loudspeaker. How, ev ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you that have no money, Come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. That's Revelation's promise. Take it as a gift. That is it in the end. So, <clears throat> looking then <clears throat> to conclude our presentation about time and our series about Revelation, re-reading this book, the time element that we will leave, that we want to linger as the most important time element, is the meantime. And here are three or four points. The water of life is drawn from the river of the water of life. This must mean that water from the healing river of the future is available in the present. And <clears throat> Number two, humanity is addressed in a state of need, tears, and thirst. All you need is need. Nothing but need. And <clears throat> thirst <laughs> is need at a visceral, elemental level and not need that breaks into intellectual propositions. Thirst is a kind of shared human experience. You're educated, you know what thirst is. You're uneducated, you know what thirst is. It's similar. Across the full range of human experience, whoever we are, ethnicity, religion, whatever. So thirst is the concept, the, element of need that Revelation will project at the end and make it relevant to us. And then, <clears throat> in the end, soon is a more important concept of time than the 1260 days. If there is a more important notion of time in this book than soon, it is the meantime.